<laughs> right, um, I'm one of the ombudsmen at Ombudsman Services. You've probably never heard of us, um, but we are the second biggest UK ombudsman scheme. Um, how many people know how many ombudsman schemes there are in the UK? <coughs> 10 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60? There's about 71, I think I'm right in saying, about 71, there are 71 schemes. Um, the vast majority are statutory, so they exist through, through the law. There are two big private sector schemes, that's us and Boris the Financial Ombudsman. <coughs> so in terms of us, um, we are a private limited company, not for profit. Um, we currently have a staff count of 600, uh, which is growing by the month. Um, this financial year we will investigate about 70,000 complaints. Uh, we operate now 11 private sector schemes, so we're getting quite experienced. Uh, the biggest ones for us is the Energy Ombudsman, which is quite high profile at the moment. Uh, we also operate communications, property and copyright licensing. And we are currently trialling a scheme for vets going through and we seem to have a few complaints about cats and castration seem to be part <coughs> Okay, um, our history, a bit of a spiel about us. We started in 2003, so we've been around for a little, a little while. Uh, we first started as the communications ombudsman, then we got the energy ombudsman scheme, then we got the surveyors ombudsman scheme, and then we've grown and grown and grown and grown. Um, so I thought we'd really have a look at what is an ombudsman, what are we all about? Where do we fit into the civil justice system? Um, we hear quite a lot about alternative dispute resolution. In many respects, an ombudsman scheme, and even ODR for that matter, it's not alternative, it becomes the only access to civil justice. Um, the vast majority of the complaints who come through our door certainly would never go to court. Uh, they can be quite low level, low value complaints. So if they do become the way of getting redress for a complaint, you probably wouldn't otherwise be able to get redress for. So I'm going to have a look at ombudsmaning. I've already said about, about us. Um, what is a complaint? Let's put it into context of the, sort of the, the tasks later on. How we do it. Um, we are a very more old-fashioned process, really. Um, we've kind of got towards ODR. We're getting there. So we have sort of three or four different strands of process flow. So it can be a very sort of stay formal type of process or we also have the sort of much more informal type of route we were talking about before. At the end of it, I've got a couple of case examples so you can have a look at the sort of typical complaints that we have a look at. Ombudsman is, is nothing new. It's been around for a, a long time, actually. Um, it came from a Swedish term, uh, Ombuds and Man. Uh, defender of the people was the, the translation. Uh, it came into the UK in 1967, <coughs> the statutory scheme. Uh, private sector, 1981, which is then the Insurance Ombudsman Bureau, which is now the Financial Om Ombudsman. 2001-2002 was the start of the sort of the, um, the, uh, the proliferation of the private sector schemes, and that's where we came, came around. Uh, Ombudsman all complaints handling. Um, our, I heard the ODR presentation. Our, our function is is to is to provide resolution. It's to look at the complaints. It's to give a decision, uh, and the decisions we give are binding. So when we make a decision at the end of the process, um, the firm, British Gas or British Telecom, whoever it might be, they have to implement the ombudsman's decision. So there's no question about binding or non-binding. But we operate in a very different world because we operate because firms have to be part of us, which is a little bit of a different existence to a, to a, a voluntary scheme. So in terms of um, ombudsman, we sit completely independent of the complainant and the firm. Um, everything we do is about openness, so we make decisions, we're quite open about it, we tell the complainant and the firm why we've come to the remedy we've come to. Uh, and, with, and our sort of principal aim here, the whole aim of all ombudsman schemes, is about, it's about redress for the citizen. So, when I say that, that's about putting the complainant back to the position they would have been in had the complaint not happened in the first place. That's kind of what our whole purpose is about. 
We, um, in your presentation before, you mentioned about sort of the pricing structure and it, is it a low level <coughs> fee for a complaint to be brought to a, to a provider? Um, the way the schemes work at the moment, it's free of charge. So the, the complaint can be brought to us. Uh, it doesn't cost the complainer anything at all. Uh, our fees are met entirely by the firms who have the complaint made against them. Um, we listen to, to both sides and we basically just sit on that fence. We sit on the fence and we give a remedy. We have a look at the facts of the case before us. We see what's gone wrong. We see what should not have gone, have gone wrong. Uh, and in doing that, we, we know the sectors are under our, jur our jurisdiction. So when you spoke about the furniture, I'm going to be a little bit quicker because he knows about furniture. Well, it's, it's true because if you don't know your sector, when you're investigating a complaint, you don't know what the firm should do or what the firm shouldn't do. So you do need to have that, set, that, set, that sector knowledge and all our investigators have that. Um, one of the other big functions that we perform is in the Ombudsman Scheme. It's not just about complaints investigation, obviously it's a, it, it, that is a big part of what we do, but it's also about sharing the learning. So we always say, and if you've met our chief exec, you'll say this phrase time and time again, um, you know, we, we should not have to be here. Complaints should be handled by the firm, the firm should resolve the complaints, there should never be a need for us as an Ombudsman Scheme to get involved in a, a dispute. In the real world, that isn't quite the case. So we sort of have a function there to feed back to the firms, to the industries, to the regulators, to say, well, what's going wrong here? What's causing these disputes? What can be done to stop these disputes happening in the first place? <coughs> Sounds quite easy. Never quite happens quite as easy as that, but we have a big function there. We have quite a big department that works quite closely with the organisations to go back to, say, Ofgem, who's the energy regulator. We'll go back to Ofgem and say, we'll see you next one. Is that happening? You might want to have a look at the rules that's driving a bit of consumer detriment. And all our staff are very well trained, and bound to say that, and we have investors in people. When we talk of, of complaints in, in true ombudsmaning, um, I don't know if it, has anybody ever here, here heard of the Green Deal? No? Once I thought so. That was quite a new government um, eco initiative, and we had lots of meetings about. But what is a complaint? When do you call a complaint a complaint? So that's basically what the official definition is of a complaint, anything. So in terms of the firms we're investigating complaints about, what we call a complaint is absolutely anything that comes in as an expression of dissatisfaction. And there's nothing else to say about it. But before, as an ombudsman scheme, we get involved in a complaint, a little bit different to what you were saying before, we allow the company the opportunity to resolve the complaint, so they have a period of eight weeks, they have a look at it, they see what they think has gone wrong, they have the opportunity to put it right, and after eight weeks, that complaint can then come to us and that becomes a legitimate complaint for us. Um, anybody here been involved in complaints investigation? One hand, any more? Another hand over there. Um, how to make a decision? It's it's quite hard to teach some staff really to do how 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 to do that. We, the the whole purpose of the decision is to return the complaint to the same position as though the mistake had not occurred. But it, it's also to make a decision that is rational, it's sensible, um, so anybody looking at it can see where you come from. Um, You've probably never heard the Wednesday rule. Anybody heard the Wednesday rule? Maybe you could, you are law students on your course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry about that. Um, although we don't speak to law students, they've never heard it. Of, of black. So it's, very, it's, it's quite obvious, really. You know, you shouldn't make a decision which is so irrational that a rational person, all the way around, wouldn't have made it. Um, so it's everything, like, you know, everything you're, you're looking at is to say, well, you made a decision, is it sensible? We're all probably going to come to a slightly different decision about a similar complaint, but it has to be within the bounds of reasonableness. Uh, and that's kind of where we're coming from. Ombudsman, um, we are an alternative to the court. So one of the big things we we always say, um, which we really sit at odds with, with, with the legal profession, um, we're not bound by, by, by precedent. 
So if we make one decision about one complaint, that doesn't become the absolute standard for every complaint of the same complaint. But after saying that, um, both complaints have to have, if you've got two similar complaints, you'd like to see two broadly similar outcomes. So in terms of what we're looking at, so if, say, we're looking at the property sector, and I'll pick on that because I'm a surveyor, uh, I'm, I'm looking at charter surveyors and what should they do, what are the rules around the industry, what are their, what, what are their, their rule books, what do their rule books say. So if an illegal <coughs> ombudsman had a complaint about you as a, as a lawyer, well, you'd like to think that the ombudsman will be looking at you as a lawyer to say, well, what should you do in that profession? And that's kind of what, what, what we're doing. So we look at regulation, we look at the regulations in the sector, we look at the relevant law. We can't ignore the law. Uh, look at codes of practice. So uh, I know nothing about legal codes of practice, but in the, in the surveying world, they have what's called a red book, and that's their Bible, basically. So we'll be looking at the, at the red book. What's good industry practice? What should happen in the industry, and that's more appropriate for those industries where the rules are a little bit more relaxed. Uh, and our whole sort of principle is about natural justice. It's about making sure there's justice available where otherwise it wouldn't be available. And your decision is made on the balance of probability, so it's a civil, it's a, it's a civil balance of probability as opposed to criminal. probably know the answer to that. Um, the aim of the investigation, is it to put somebody in a better position, is it a worse position, is it the same, the same <coughs> position? Um, we handle something like with three quarters of a million contacts this year, uh, and probably the vast majority of the complainants coming through on the phone uh, think we're some kind of big compensation machine where they're going to get £10,000 because they've happened to have made a complaint. Um, that's not an ombudsman's purpose. The ombudsman's purpose is to, as I said before, is to return the person complaining to rectify the mistake. So the answer there, same position. <coughs> okay, the way I thought you've gone through the ODR and the sort of almost the theory behind it, I'm going to run through how we operate and how actually an ADR system works in practice. Um, we spoke before about levelling the playing field and allowing all complaints access to, to, to justice. And that's actually very, very, very true. For every complaint we, we take, we actually go through this investigation, we probably get about 10 or 12 contacts. And that a lot of those contacts, it's about helping the consumer to make, to make the complaint. So in the ODR platform world, then it has to be easy, it has to be simple. People need to know how to communicate, how to put the complaint together. Uh, when you spoke about the package being able to do that for you, but that, that, is, that is vital. Because we, we find that um, you know, we do need to help people to say to actually communicate what the complaint is and to put forward what they want to get to resolution. Sometimes they don't know. So we have, we have an inquiries department, um, a contact centre rather than a call centre, uh, of about 200 staff, uh, as I say, handling this year would be about 750,000 contacts. And by contacts, that could be telephone, written, email, a whole, whole shebang. Um, we've also got online portal, so it could come through by, by the portal. But there's a lot of contacts there versus the amount of complaints that we actually investigate. And a lot of that function is to allow the complainant to be able to complain. Sounds a little bit alien to the firms who we investigate complaints about because they probably like to think that we don't help them too much. But you know, part of our function is to make sure that there's a level playing field between big British gas, I want to say British gas because it's just come to mind, and, and me trying to make, make, make the complaint. Part, part of that function, um, when you said about is it a spam complaint, is it a spurious complaint, we get a lot of spurious complaints, that, that's, that, that's for sure. So part of, part of the function at the very front end, well, is it actually a valid complaint? Is it a complaint that we can handle? Um, is it something that's vexatious? Is, is the person making the vexatious complaints? Uh, and you know, they, they, are, they are out there. And part of the, the, call, the contact centre's role is to say, well, is it a complaint for us? Yes, it is. Take it on. If it's not a complaint for us, well, say why it's not a complaint. And if it might be a complaint which 
We can't look at, but maybe citizens advice can. So we'll also signpost elsewhere. Um, and we might also have to signpost to, to a different ombudsman scheme. Uh, one of the problems with having 71 schemes in the UK uh, is that there's a huge patchwork of, of, of real providers. Um, if you look at the property world, there's three Amazon schemes there. So an estate agent, for example, if you've got a complaint about an estate agent, it can choose one of three providers. So we've got to make sure that we sign post people to the correct schemes. And that's kind of what we're there to do. And also, um, to try and move with the times, um, we also have what's called an early resolution. It's more of a mediation type, type approach to, to investigation. Um, so that's for those low level, low value type complaints. Could be somebody hasn't received a phone bill, something as exciting as that. We'll get it resolved at the front end so we don't need to go through to that more formal investigation. Okay, so that, that's, in practice, that's how, that's how it works. Um, so all exciting stuff, I know I can tell. The, the contact com comes in, if we can't take it, We'll signpost elsewhere. If we can take it, we will, we will work with, with the complainant to fill out the complaint form. Once we're happy it's a complaint we can accept, we then shoot it off to the investigation department. And the next picture um, is probably slightly a little bit better in terms of comparing ODR and, and how the more modern way of investigating might just play, play a part for, for us. The, the inquiry five years ago would have come in by phone or by post, probably more post than by, than by phone. Um, we now have a portal, so complainants can come to us online, online form. Um, we no longer wait for a written signed form to comply with, with DPA. Uh, we can accept the, phone, the form or complaints on it over the phone. Um, we then get to, we've got a handshake over there. Um, is it something that we can resolve much more informally? Is it something which is of, say, value of £30? Um, does it need to go to a proper investigation of two stages with two reports and two chances of appeal? Probably not. So we are looking, and we do, how many complaints can we actually achieve by through that more <coughs> informal resolution? And you mentioned 80%, I think, you were, um, you were working to. Um, we probably get through in terms of the very more simple, straightforward types of investigation about 70% of our cases now, so you're probably not a million miles away there. Uh, why those more simple cases get to us, who knows, but they do. Um, but that's why we also we look at the complaint, is it something that is detailed? If it is, it probably will need a, bit, a very detailed investigation. There's lots of disputes out there that are very low level, very low value. They are disputes nevertheless, they need resolution, so let's have a look at it and see what we can do very, very quickly. If we get to the middle bit there, then that's something which is more complicated. Um, so in terms of those sectors under our jurisdiction, um, we're handling complaints about child surveyors, so that, that's somebody who's surveyed your house, that spotted, not spotted a crack in the wall, it's cost you £50,000 to put it right. They're detailed investigations. You know, they need a team of people to pick up the file, to have a look at the photographs, to have a look at all the information. They're detailed, long-winded, or time-consuming investigations. If that's the type of complaint we're looking at, then that is very much a physical type of investigation. There's not much of an online platform can help us there. We actually have to have staff to do that for us. We then send a, a report out. Um, and other party can appeal. If it appeals, we review the complaint again. If we, uh, once we review the complaint again, we send our decision out. Uh, once it goes out, and if it's accepted by the complainant, that remedy is binding. There's, there's no question of any of our schemes whether it's a binding or non-binding remedy. Uh, everything we do, the firms have to in implement. And we have the strength of the industry regulators behind us to make sure that happens. <coughs> Although in reality, we don't really have much of an issue about it. Um, we also, in between those two stages, we have what's called a mutually acceptable settlement. So again, it's, if it's something which is not really complicated, but not really easy, um, it's something we can have a look at on a sort of middle informal basis. 
uh, does pick up the phone and have a chat to people and see if we can try and negotiate a settlement with them. So it's kind of broad and consistent with what you were saying before in terms of the ODR and how that's going to operate. <coughs> Clear as mud, I suspect. Um, so that's, that's basically um, 600 people's roles in a one piece of uh, PowerPoint. Um, the complaint comes in. If it's easy, we manage it. We try to early resolution it. If it's a proper investigation, we present our findings to firm and complainant. Either party can request a review. If the review, we review it. Then we issue our final findings. If the customer disagrees, it disappears off. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, customer can still go to court. The, the option of the court action is never taken away from them purely because they come and use us. If they do agree to the resolution offered, we obviously notify the firm uh, and then it's binding on the company and the company then has to implement that, that, that remedy. So in terms of the financials, uh, property is 25,000, uh, vets and all the other schemes, 10,000 pound limit per complaint. So it's pretty straightforward stuff really. I've kind of separated out ODR and ADR. <coughs> ADR for us is probably a more of a structured formal process, um, probably more of a sort of more paper based, person based. <coughs> um, we're still looking at the same facts whether you are ODR or ADR, but in terms of an ombudsman scheme and what we're doing, the vast majority you could probably put the camp of the ADR up rather than the ODR. A lot of the cases which we go through to a more formal investigation do require that quite detailed, quite long-winded, time-consuming type of investigation. Uh, and we have investigation officers who do that for us. Uh, there's no sort of real IT package out there that can have a look at a uh, 45,000 energy bills, for example. Or maybe there is, I don't know. Um, ODR, <coughs> you've always got the same complaint aims. You still have a complaint to, to investigate, it's how you kind of facilitate that, that complaint. Um, there is obviously the users platform out there. We, we have our own online portal system where complaints come in, we communicate with complaints and firms by the, by the platform and the portal. Um, for us, we're not quite as advanced as um, having a much more automated process, but um, we use online more about the way we communicate rather than the way we investigate. So we haven't got quite that sort of platform where we're, we're doing the, the use this type of extensive uh, online work. But we are communicating much more via, via the portal, which is quicker for us, quicker for the consumer. The consumer can see where the complaint is up to, they can see exactly when the decision is going to be arriving. And then we communicate the decision online to, to complainants and to um, and to firm. One of the other good examples of um, ODR, I'm not sure whether I should have put this in with you, but you sat there. There's an organisation out there called Resolve. I don't know if anybody is, you certainly would have heard of it. Um, they, they're kind of doing a, sim a similar thing, which is to, which is very much of an online to help the complainant. So they'll, they'll package the, the complaint together. Um, they'll, they'll almost word the complaint form for them put the complaint to the company uh, and then they will instruct us if the, if the complaint isn't, isn't resolved. It's probably quite a good example of how the ADR world is moving quite quickly <coughs> and quite and quite dramatically really. Um, five, five years ago in Ombudsman, you would never have heard of the ADR, ADR directly, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and we were all very staid in a very old fashioned way, have a very strict three stage process that it takes. 12 months to get through the process. The, the, those days are changing now. It's very much getting towards that ODR, that online platform, speed but quality at the same time. I think my next screen is parking fines. Um, one of our latest schemes to, to come up on board is the, the 11th scheme. Um, we have a, a contract to investigate car parking fines. Uh, I've not been involved in this at all, so I'm pleased to say. 
Um, but because it's quite um, it's quite low level, low value, I think it's fair to say that the highest fine we've seen so far is seventy five pounds. Compared to the stuff, it's quite low level. Um, we are working very much on, on an ODR type type approach, so it, it won't go to a detailed investigation. It'll be very much a very quick look of something which comes in online at the facts of the case. Um, our fee for doing so is dramatically reduced because of that, which then goes on to when we're talking about fees as a consequence of the ADR directive. Um, a more detailed investigation is quite expensive to do. That's not going to work for something which is very sort of low consumer level value of things. Um, if you think about a residual body, uh, it could be something as simple as, uh, I don't know, you, you, you bought a tin of baked beans from Asda. Um, you know, you're not, Asda's not going to pay us £400 to investigate a complaint about a tin of baked ba beans. Um, so you have to have those processes which allow us to investigate the complaints very quickly. And uh, Poplar, which is the, the private parking uh, organisation, is a good example of that because they, they are very simple, very quick complaints to investigate, where we will use an online platform and we will investigate in a very cheap, cheap way as well. Anyway, so I thought um, you've heard us two talking. Um, if you're all legal people, these would be as easy as they come, I suspect. Um, each one is about an appeal against a parking fine. Um, the first one, and these are the arguments you do see quite regularly from those people who are handling complaints. So basically a nurse has had a parking fine. Um, she says she was on call to an elderly patient um, and parks <coughs> to avoid parking in the Mark Bay requiring a permit, she parks in front of a garage. Um, lo and behold, she had a parking fine. <coughs> Um, we're working in terms of the Boplar contract, we are looking at the complaint after their own people have investigated. So their own assessor's determination was uh, she was parking in a, in a car park which required a permit. Um, she parked in a manner to obstruct the garage and didn't park in a, in a, a marked bay. Probably can't get too clearer, too poles apart of the case before us. Hands up if you think she got away with it. No good hands up if you think she had to pay the fine. Okay. Um, she was a nurse. She was calling an elderly patient. Uh, when we spoke about, when I spoke about the code of practice, then we had to look at the code of practice for parking. Um, the parking code says if she does have a badge or a health emergency badge, then that's fine, they can park wherever they want to. And lo and behold, she didn't have the permit. Um, it's a bit debatable whether she obstructed the garage or not, apparently. Um, but anyway, she didn't have the permit, couldn't park in the car park, and she had to pay the parking fine. I've got two more, I'm afraid to say, parking examples. So stick with me. I'm not sure why we put again, we pulled against a parking <coughs> fine, it's quite obvious, really. Um, one, one of the other rules for our, a parking fine in, on private land is that the, the fine has to reflect the actual loss. So uh, by loss we mean they've lost the opportunity to earn another £4.50 for an hour's parking in a parking space. So if you ever get a parking fine in a parking land and it's £100, it's probably worth questioning. Um, in this case, the fine, I think she, that's right, she got overstayed by 17 minutes. Uh, and the fine was £95, so the, uh, the appellant appealed. Um, the operator's case said, <coughs> TNC is clearly displayed saying parking is for four hours, she overstayed 17 minutes, and the facts of the case in theory are not, are not denied. Uh, and the £95, I think it's £95, uh, was a genuine pre-estimate of loss. Um, and in that pre-estimate of loss that included overheads. So that extra £4.50, uh, which she should have paid for the extra hours parking, was actually worth to the firm £95. Good business if you can get it. <coughs> okay, so going back to a code of practice, um, the operator's scheme says the charge can't be punitive or unreasonable, 
whether you consider £95 to be unreasonable. Uh, the charge must be based on pre estimate of loss, so it's that lost opportunity for somebody else to come along and park in the parking space. Um, the operator didn't tell us what the overheads were, what this loss of overheads was supposed to be. So the appeal went through. They, they didn't pay the parking fine. <coughs> Last one. Are we all excited? Okay. Parking charge again. There we go. Um, I love the way these are being written. The appellant has parked in a manner which, whilst within the terms and conditions of the car park, was obstructive to other users of the car park. Like a policeman's uh, way, way, way of writing. Um, the person making the, the complaint was saying, I've not broken any TNCs here. Uh, I parked in the car park, I parked in the car park, I should be allowed to park in, uh, and I've not blocked any other, any other vehicles in so you can clear off with your, with your car parking. They, uh, they had a diagram, so I'm not sure who provided the diagram, but um, somebody drew the parking lot. Um, they can make a fine if the parking breaks with the TNCs, pretty obvious stuff. Um, but the TNCs actually didn't say that you can't park in an obstructive way for some reason. And also, from the diagram and the pictures, um, actually the car wasn't parked in an obstructive way anyway. So uh, why the operator gave the fine in the first place, we'll never know, but they did. So when we made the decision, we said, well, actually, your parking was fine. And in any event, your TCs didn't say you couldn't block into the car. Um, so they got away with it, for once a better phrase. That's kind of a whistle-stop tour of an ombudsman in an ADR, a you know, very private sector scheme um, in practice. It's it's about for us the way that we operate and the way that we exist. It's very different to that sort of voluntary um, scheme as a consequence of the ADR di directive. Um, we exist because statutory reasons are there. Uh, for example, in the energy world, off-chain dictates the energy firms have to belong to an ombudsman scheme, so that makes life a lot easier for us. Um, the ADR directive will change the world quite quickly, and quite dramatically. Um, I think bases said something different about the residual body in terms of a tender, uh, which might just not alter the way that body works. Uh, but it is a rapidly changing world of complaints handling and ADR. That's at Ombudsman Services in about 25 minutes, I think. Um, so 75,000 complaints in 25 minutes will be alright. Um, if you want to visit us on our website, feel free to do so. It's a great website. Um, we're on Twitter. Again, if you want to follow us, it's full of quite interesting stuff. Uh, and, I think we're also, and, um, and I think we're also on Facebook as well, our Facebook page. So we are moving with the time, so for that, but Ombuds Morning is pretty good. Um, so thank you very much. I hope it's not been too uninteresting, but um, that's OS for you. I assume other folks will probably have questions. Um, for the law students who's looking to mm -hmm. practice their, what they're learning, <laughs> what does the Ombudsman Services offer uh, in terms of possible internships and summer vacation schemes? Um, we, we employ as investigation officers quite, quite a lot of qualified lawyers. Um, it's, not, it's not a pre-requirement to be investigated to be, a, to be a lawyer, but we've got people from all sorts of, all sorts of backgrounds. Um, Internships, I don't think we've really got any opportunities at, at, at the moment. Okay. But in terms of employment as investigators or even as an uh, ombudsman, um, you know, we've all got various backgrounds, and, and a legal background is certainly um, one, of the most, one of the most beneficial we're ever going to have. So it's certainly, certainly something that's out there as a career if you wanted to. Um, yeah, I'm sure if that answers it. But. Okay. What what are the types of complaints do you see in the future that your company will be handling? It, <coughs> I think it depends on, on, on how those jurisdictions come about, come, come about really. Okay. Um, if you think about the the vet scheme, um, the College of, of Veterinary Surgeons <coughs> approached us. Um, they're not compelled to have an on, on, on scheme, but they they decided to to try to try one. Um, 
They're very different complaints to everything else we, we handle. So you know, who knows? I wouldn't have thought six, six months ago I'd be looking at complaints about castration and a rabbit. So it's um, um, and it, it could be anything now from you know, my kitchen doors falling off my kitchen to the car's broken down. A aviation, who knows? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big market out there to be had. Any questions? All right. Jolly good. Well, thank you. <laughs>